All right, we are live. Uh, welcome to this installment of the Escarpment Labs webinar series. Um, this is one of our Brewer interviews. We're going to be talking today here with Joe Wells. Um, Joe Wells has done a lot of things in the beer industry. Um, he's worked at Hangar 24 Craft Brewery in Southern California, also at Bench Brewing in Ontario, Canada, not too far from us. Um, and he's also currently the lead brewer at Fair State Brewing Cooperative in Minnesota, working with a dedicated team to produce world-class lagers, IPAs, and pastry stouts. Um, welcome to the uh, to the webinar series, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how's it going, Richard? Pretty good. Uh, I just want to mention before we uh, sort of kick things off that uh, this is going to be the second last uh, webinar in our series. Um, after this, we're going to be um, sort of uh, taking a little bit of a break to uh, make sure that we're able to put together all the content to uh, keep the quality standards high um, and uh, sort of move forward with it with uh, more stuff as we get into the rest of the year. We did actually build out a roadmap for uh, the rest of the year through till December. So you can expect to see a lot more from us um, in the coming months. But uh, we've recognized that we've been doing these, you know, two of these things a week for, you know, since mid uh, mid March. And uh, um, that's not necessarily sustainable. So uh, really looking forward to uh, this is going to be the last one that I'm sort of in charge of. And uh, Nate's going to be talking about uh, quick sours and how you can make those uh, really, really well. Um, and, you know, not have to worry about your kettle sours stalling out. Um, and then we're going to take a little break and uh, maybe you'll see a little bit of uh, YouTube content pop up in the, in the meantime. Um, so that's sort of our intro spiel. Uh, thanks for agreeing to do this, Joe. I know, uh, you know, back when we started planning this uh, series, I reached out to you and said, Hey, you know, why don't we do a, why don't we talk about what you're up to? Cause you know, you're always a fountain of knowledge uh, for me on the, on the production side of beer. Often if I have, questions about how a certain type of beer is made, I, I often do reach out to you. So really appreciate your knowledge. Yeah, no problem. It's uh, great to be here. So. Cool. Um, so before we get into, into you know, uh, Fair State and what Fair State's up to you, let's talk about you. So how did you get into brewing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I brewed my first batch of hard cider when I was 19 or 18, maybe, on my parents' kitchen counter, and ever since then, got was in beer. So when I went back to college yeah, at like 23 years old, I met a guy, he was my lab partner in chemistry, and he is now, he's brewed at Other Half in Brooklyn, he now brews at Folk's Beer in Brooklyn. He's this big, tall, giant guy named Joe as well. We were the two Joes. And he got me back into homebrewing. and was like, you got to brew beer. We're going to hang out. We're going to drink a bunch of beer. And uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be in the beer industry, like, hands down. He was the reason. So got done with college, had a degree in analytical chemistry, and moved to Minnesota, worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a while, and then uh, ended up finding this position in Southern California at Hangar 24, running their quality lab and had to go. So uh, they taught me a lot. I learned a lot. I worked with some really great guys, you know, Kevin Wright, who is now the owner at Third Space in Milwaukee. He was a great teacher, wonderful brewer, smart guy, really lucky to have worked for him. So um, after that, bounced around, Ended up everywhere, came back to Minnesota so I could be near my wife's family and uh, raise a little baby and do all kinds of adulty things and somehow fell into this position at Fair State that has uh, treated me very well. You know, uh, I work with a really dedicated crew of guys. Uh, Nico Tonks is our head brewer. He is a remarkably smart and talented brewer. He came from Live Oak before this. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody that knows how to brew a lager, it's, it's Nico. And I, I owe him a lot for the uh, info that I've learned from him over the last couple of years. So that's, that's where I came from. Awesome. I still, uh, I remember the first time I met Nico was, was at the, the, that beer festival in, in, in Duluth. Um, and, you know, as part of the schedule for this festival, there was a lager tour being put on by, by Nico and, no one showed up and then, and then a bunch of, I was with a few other brewers and, and, you know, showed up and at, at, you know, at the fair state booth and said, Hey, you know, 
can we do the logger tour? I just remember him being so stoked that people actually wanted to do this. Um, and also being so depressed that, you know, none of the attendees wanted to do that. Yeah. You know, making high end loggers is kind of like a, a passion thing. It, you know, <laughs> we, we definitely make money making Pilsner and Vienna lager and fest beer, but, uh, we'd probably make more money if we just made hazy IPAs, but I want to drink the beer that I make. So I'm like a big proponent of us making more lagers. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you, if you ever find yourself in, in Minnesota um, or other places, I've seen it in Quebec. Um, the Fair State Hills is a pretty good one. Thanks. We, uh, we like that beer a lot. Yeah. What are you drinking right now? I'm drinking a uh, Bierstadt Helles. So one of our former packaging staff, he moved to Colorado and I sent him a message when I saw that Bierstadt was filling cans and I was like, Will, you got to send me some beer, man. And so a case of uh, Hellas and Pilsner showed up uh, yesterday. Awesome. That's awesome. You know, it's actually kind of funny. There's a common thread here because our um, the last brewer interview that I did with, with Avery Swanson um, in Chicago, uh, she was also drinking. I don't think it was the same beer, but she was drinking a, a beer stat beer as well. So obviously a uh, industry favorite. Um, yeah. I haven't had a chance to get out there, but now, I mean, I don't know if I ever will, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I've, I've only heard good things. So um, tell us a little bit more about Fair State and, and what is what is your role at Fair State? Yeah, so Fair State's been around for about six years. We have a very small tap room in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, Northeast is like this arts district. It's where all the cool shit's at. There's 30 breweries within a five mile circle, maybe a half a dozen distilleries. Um, it's, it's where all the good taco shops are at. Uh, we, we like Northeast a lot, but it's expensive and our facility there is tiny. You know, it's a seven barrel system that is shoehorned into like a seven hundred square foot garage. So we built a big facility across town. It's about 35,000 square feet. We've got a 30 barrel, four vessel DME brew house from, you know, before DME went out of business. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, we've got a bunch of lagering tanks from the 1960s, these little cherry Burrell, gorgeous American steel tanks, uh, mostly 90 barrel fermenters, centrifuge a pretty sizable room for oak storage for mixed culture beer and a canning line. So uh, this year before pre COVID, we were looking to do like, you know, 14,000 barrels or so. Uh, obviously that number will be severely truncated because of the current situation. But um, you know, it's, it's a pretty good sized production facility. We've got about 12 guys on production team and that's ranging from you know, head brewer Nico through me, through my brewers, packaging guys, uh, one quality lab staff. So we, we do distribution across, I think, 14 states. And wow. we also send to J Japan and Quebec. <laughs> um, if I can ever get Richard uh, Sigmundson to take some beer, we'll send it to Ontario as well. But uh, I got to gotta work out on a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I would love to. I would love to see it here. Um, I don't know. I have no idea about the economics of of that arrangement, but uh, I think that'd be pretty pretty rad to see. Um, it's just a great beer. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those ones that, that yeah. I think anytime I've gone out to Minnesota, I've I've brought a bunch back, and it's disappeared quickly. Um, cool. Um, so, like, what has how have you guys had to change in response to COVID? Cause I know, you know, we had a little, we had a call a few days ago and you said, you know, we're hiring. Isn't that weird? Um, how, how does that happen? Uh, you know, because so Minnesota, just to give you some background on Minnesota beer laws. So Minnesota yes, won't let talk about sell this. you a four pack of beer, like a, a four pack <laughs> of 16 ounce cans that would be illegal and I would lose my liquor license if I sold you that beer. 
but yeah. I can put a 750 mil crowler and sell that to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have very trans transmissioned our, our team over to filling crawlers, delivery. We don't have a tap room open anymore, so it's a drive up curb service thing. We built a whole web portal so you can like log on, buy your beer, and it's ready like 45 minutes later or something. Uh, we more or less shut down brewing for about a month and a half. And in that time, we did a couple of small bashes, nothing really too strange. We had to cut a couple of one-off beers we had planned, which is actually probably the, the saddest one. We were planning on brewing about 200 barrels of a lager collab with Bierstadt. Oh, wow. But, uh, we cut it down to 15 barrels at our tap room for growlers or crawlers only. Um, that was kind of sad, but we survived. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like today, my eldest brewer, he's been on our team the longest. He was delivering crawlers to people's houses. Um, I also, you know, I we were brewing. We brewed uh, 30 barrels of pale ale today, but uh, we are filling all roles. You know, the, the production staff is filling crawlers, delivering, working the tap room, and we're trying to hire for the tap room so we can fill that back up and pull everybody back. You know, basically overnight, all draft sales stopped. They were done for, and because total wine is one of our major accounts they didn't have any four packs on their website and we don't do any 12 packs our orders plummeted really fast so things are catching up now people are actually going out they're buying beer they've figured out how to wear face masks and wash their hands and use hand sanitizer and so our orders are like sh shoot through the roof again they're where they should be so yeah, we're we're hiring, which is crazy. And I think if you told me a month ago that we'd be hiring, I'd tell you you're crazy. But, uh, it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's been a roller coaster. Like uh, we're in the same position. We we did actually hire someone um, <laughs> during this just because we needed the the help. And uh, you know, yeah, we're sort of operating a more distributed team now as well, and you know, less people on site. So. You know, that required having a little bit more, you know, attention paid to how people rotate in and out just to avoid burnout. And, you know, this is this is tough because, like, at the, at the end of the day, I think a lot of beer businesses, um, breweries and suppliers are working hard to harder to make the same dollar. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how, how uh, you know, long term sustainable this whole thing is, but it, it does seem like a lot of people are making it work and, and you know getting creative and that's that's really inspiring agreed you know looking at the breweries around town the amount of stuff they're doing it's creative it's interesting they're trying to get customers uh, one of my good buddies is at forager brewing down in rochester minnesota and they're doing these uh, meal packs it's a week of food for two people pizza and burger and salad and pad thai and everything else and it comes with like six crawlers and it's 150 bucks, and they deliver it to your front door. Um, That's great. And they're selling a bunch of them. They're making money. So, yeah, yeah man, like that. That's that's uh, that's a big part of, of you know how it's got to change. And like uh, very similar, um, um, not too far from us, uh, Willibald, uh, which is a distillery uh, brewery as well. They and they uh, started selling you know, fresh pasta noodles and sauce to go. And, uh, you know, it sounds like they're moving a lot of, a lot of noodles and sauce. And, you know, that's awesome. We, we should all just start making soup base and cinnamon rolls. And, you know, we, the, the joke of like, I'm a pastry stout brewer. I'm actually just a baker who makes liquid bread. Uh, yeah. it, it'd be more apt. We could just start selling cinnamon roll in a can. Like <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> Yeah, like the uh, the Pillsbury thing where you just twist it. It's just, but it's just yeah. a beer can. Yeah, <laughs> it's got legs. <laughs> oh man. 
Um, you are a little bit of a, I don't know if you take offense to that, but I know that you're a bit of a, you know, an expert when it comes to pastry stouts. Uh, I know you guys do a fair bit of these things. Uh, definitely saw, you know, a lot of Instagram posts from you. Maybe, maybe uh, not so much after after March, but before that of, you know, 30, 40 Plato warts. Uh, tell me a bit about your approach to those kinds of beers. Yeah, they're fun. They're, they're fun to brew. They're fun to figure out. I drink about four ounces of one, unless I'm shotgunning it and I have to drink the whole can. But uh, they're they're interesting. I I see a lot of like growth in the beer industry that we're playing with new ingredients, so it's it's fun to make. Um, one of the things I like to I like to think about when I make them is um, not overpowering with too much roast malt. You know, the classic stout beer has like up to 5% roast malt in it, which is just way too much when you're making this highly concentrated wort. You end up with a beer that tastes ashy. Um, people don't want that. People want like chocolate. They want sweet flavors. So dial the roast back, boil the crap out of it. You know, as, as much as people want to like argue the semantics of melanoidin reactions don't happen during a long boil, there are characteristics that happen to wort when you boil it for 12 hours. You get flavor from that that you wouldn't get otherwise. And it's also pretty much physically impossible to make 40 Play-Doh wort without boiling it for 12 hours unless it's 75% dextrose. Um, which is not to be say saying that anybody should be afraid of using dextrose. Uh, uh, a normal pastry stout for us is going to have over a thousand pounds of dextrose in a hundred barrels of beer. Um, that's, I mean, we definitely made some that are higher than that. <laughs> uh, one of the other big things I like to think about is not stressing the yeast out. If we pitch yeast into 37 Play-Doh wort, it's not going to do anything. It's going to take out, it'll ferment to like maybe 25 Play-Doh and then die off. So we generally will one batch um, like day one, keep that at like 25 Play-Doh, lots of oxygen, lots of, lots of yeast. Brew more the next day, more oxygen, more yeast, get the Play-Doh up to like maybe 35 on that. And then on the third day, we will kick out a batch that's like 46, 50 Play-Doh, something crazy like that. And that brings up the total sugar content high enough that we'll get 14% alcohol and still have 14, 15 Play-Doh finishing gravity. Um, <laughs> if you want those flavors, high amounts of vanilla and chocolate, coconut, things of that nature, to really like eat, have a lot of oomph to them, you need sugar and you need alcohol. Like they really carry the flavor through, and you you cannot make a beer that has as much coconut flavor as a 14% stout in like a 6% alcohol beer that's four kind of fishing gravity. Yeah. You need how many of sugar. So yeah, I never even thought about that. That's an interesting approach. So you're sort of brewing three consecutive days higher higher uh, sugar concentration each day to sort of get the yeast used to the environment and sort of keep chugging along. Um, and then presumably mm -hmm you're hitting the like upper edge of the alcohol tolerance of the yeast. And that's kind of what's stabilizing the beer. Like I, I never thought about it this way, actually, that, that, that a uh, pastry stout is, is actually made a lot like port wine. Um, you just kind of yeah. bump, bump things up with sugar until the yeast dies. And you've got that residual sweetness. That's stable. Huh? You don't want to go <laughs> too high and yeah. with the wrong yeast though, because if you kill it off too soon, you end up with something that tastes like green apples. Right, you know, yeah. If you've been like a beer geek long enough, you remember the uh, like 2010 Dark Lord was really famous for this like, green apple flavor. Um, you know, we don't want to do that again. <laughs> so we actually normally use London Nail 3. Uh, okay. Chugs along, it'll hit 14% alcohol pretty easily. I've got one beer we used to hit like 16.5, I think. Um, if I want to go higher than that, I really like USO5 or 001. 
you know, Cali Ill yeast, if you treat it right, you can hit 20%. Yeah. Uh, yeah you can. I definitely, I made a beer in California at Hangar that hit 18.9% using Cali Ale. And it had a fish gravity that was like four and a half, you know. Mm-hmm. So. so, like, if you're, uh, how big is your, is each batch the, of wort that you're making? Like, on your brew house, I imagine you can't make, like, a 30-barrel batch of this kind of concentrated wort, especially when you're boiling it so long. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, luckily, when DME designed our brew house, they designed us with an oversized kettle. So I can okay. fit like 52 barrels lapping at the door. So we will mash in a batch, run off, start boiling that, clean out our water ton, mash in the second batch, and then water that directly on top of the other running. So we'll collect like 26 barrels out of a mash, you end up with 52 barrels, boil that for 10 hours, you get about 40 barrels. Uh, it concentrates it a lot and then pounds of dextrose and you got yourself some high quality wars <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy so, so it's almost like you're 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 getting a lot of your fermentables from the added dextrose and and a lot of the malt sugars are really you know in, in a lot of ways unfermentable yeah. or at least a good we, of them. we mash really high yeah. so we'll, we'll okay. mash in at like 157 158 do a 15 minute mash and then a full 170 degree mash out. Okay. So we end up with a lot of unfermentables. By having the full mash out, we end up with a little bit thinner in the water so you can actually water it so they don't turn to just a brick. Cool. And um, I don't I don't know if you're if you're making a lot of barley wines these days, but I know that's kind of how you <laughs> rose to notoriety in uh, you know certain uh, certain beer geek circles. Um, how, how is your approach for barley wines any different? Uh, it's mostly the same. It's just uh, leaning a little bit more heavily on like crystal malts and pale chocolate malt, things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's pretty similar, you know. I think long gone are the days of the American barley wine. Nobody wants a 100 IBU, 14% alcohol, toffee forward, oniony American barley wine as much as like I kind of enjoy those somewhat uh, <laughs> nobody wants that so keep the hopping really low you know whirlpool edition of something noble get like 10 15 IBUs on something that's pretty high <laughs> oh wow okay big boy but then, anyway, you go like you look into history and like especially go back to like the 1800s there's like uh, beers that were being made that were ridiculously high gravity and high alcohol. So, you know, that's the kind of funny thing is like, this is nothing new. We've been doing this crazy stuff for a long time. Well, I, I would assume that like, you know, guys in Britain are sitting there watching the French make wine that's 14% alcohol. Yeah. They can ship it in a much smaller volume and get much drunker. <laughs> And if you're sending it to like troops overseas, you might as well send something that's higher alcohol content. So it's a smaller shipping vessel. Make it big. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Have you have you been have you made any barley wines at at Fair State? Yeah. So since I've been here, we've done one that's been packaged, one that's still in barrels that might get turned into two, depending on how the barrels taste. And then uh, we have plans of doing another one this fall that's going to be a wide release, uh, probably 16 ounce cans all over the place. Cool. 16 ounce cans of barley wine. Yeah, I just uh, put the recipe together for that and started doing the costing on it to make sure, like, we'd actually make money. And uh, it's, I think, 15.5% alcohol. So it'll be fun. <laughs> There's no restrictions to to uh, alcohol content in Minnesota, but you can't sell a four pack of of uh, tall cans. It has to be a crowler. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. The the Minnesota beer laws are not about safety. They're not about responsible drinking. They are about government control, 
and and they have a lot to do with the distributor laws and the three tier system. You know, the the wealth power lies in the uh, the distribution side. The distributors they have all the money, they have all the power, and so they make the rules. So distributors don't want us to sell beer directly to people. We don't get to. That's crazy. And that, and that has not changed in, in response to COVID because like, this is really the only way that breweries can make money is by selling beer directly to people right now. You'd think it would, <laughs> but no, they, they were, had a law. It was, it was brought up in, uh, in the state house and the state Senate. They talked about it. There was an amendment to another law that they tried to get and it never worked. That's too bad. I, I'm in this, you know, very bizarre position of, of saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry your beer laws are crazier than ours um, because Ontario is, is special in its own ways as well. But, you know, a lot of things change uh, after, after COVID, you know, restaurants can sell beer to go, for example, um, <laughs> which really helps out the brew pubs and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously you know, breweries can always sell beer to go in whatever format they want. The uh, distributors here, they allowed a law to get passed that lets restaurants sell beer. But they're limited to one bottle of wine per meal or one six pack of beer per meal. Hmm. Okay. So that, I mean, that's still an arrangement that really benefits the distributors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very much so too bad and um, it's, i mean i don't know it's kind of offensive to me in general like one bottle of wine uh, like, not a meal yeah if i order <laughs> if i order food for me and my wife from like this really cool vietnamese bistro that's like six blocks from our house i can order one bottle of wine to go with our like pho and short ribs like come on we're, we're one bottle of wine's not gonna do it <laughs> Yeah, that, that's how I feel. It's crazy. Huh. Um, you guys are, I mean, I was going to say, you sort of mentioned it. Like, you guys are making all sorts of stuff. I know you've got a whole uh, barrel aging room going on at Fair State as well. And uh, I know you've released a few things out of there. I know I remember you talking about a, a, like a gin barrel aged Saison. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's exciting in that barrel room right now? There's one batch that I'm really excited about. We bottled it up. It's conditioning still. I think we're going to release it in about a month and a half now. Uh, it came from this idea of making a Aperol spritz. Um, we made a 17% alcohol seltzer. We flavored <laughs> the seltzer with like orange peel and cinnamon and some grape juice and all these things to make it taste like an Aperol spritz. I then took a keg of that Aperol spritz, blended it with two wine barrels full of, or yeah, they were wine barrels, full of 4% alcohol, really hoppy mixed culture table beer, and used that as the priming sugar to carbonate the bottles. So it's, it's like intangible spiciness and citrus like cinnamon base layer, little 4% table beer that is just imminently crushable. And I'm really excited for that one to come out. That sounds awesome. I, I want, I want that right now. I, I've definitely <laughs> been, uh, um, yeah, like I love that combination of just like bitter, bitter spirits and like light crushable beers. Right. Um, yeah, I mean We've seen that with like spaghetti. People are drinking spaghetti like crazy right now. I what, what is spaghetti for the uninformed? Back high life very recently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the uninformed, what is a spaghetti? Uh, spaghetti is Miller High Life, about an ounce and a half to two ounces of Aperol mm -hmm. and uh, lemon wedge. Okay, great. I mean, I've been drinking these for for months and and didn't know that's what that was called. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's delicious <laughs> juice. Like, uh -huh. sit on your patio in the sun and drink spaghetti. Mm -hmm. You might get really drunk, but you could definitely do it all day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
and you can experiment with different loggers. You know, it doesn't have to be high life. Um, I mean, high life's pretty great, but. <laughs> Cool. I man, I want to try that beer. Maybe we can do a little yeah. trade. Yeah, I'll send you some, <laughs> or else I'll I'll bring some to the border and like throw it over because we can't bring it over legally. Yeah, yeah. You can <laughs> ship stuff though. That's the kind of funny part. The borders are closed, but you can you can ship whatever you want. So, um, cool. Um, so let's talk about Pilsners. Could you walk us through um, you, your approach to, to, to the Fair State Pils or just loggers in general? Yeah, sure. So uh, Fair State Pils is, I mean, that beer predates my time at Fair State a fair bit. So some of this is uh, stolen valor, we'll call it. <laughs> uh, the beer is, is largely based on choosing the right materials and then treating them properly. Uh, you can't make a proper German pills using RAR 2 row malt. I love RAR 2 row malt. I love RAR maltine. But uh, to make a proper German style Pilsner, or Bohemian Pilsner, you need German malt. You need that flavor. You need it to work the way that German malt works. We do a multi step mash. You know, we have a protein rest in there. It's got a couple different steps. We boil it for 90 minutes and it's largely bittered through the whirlpool. You know, it's oh, a pretty wow. heavy bittering charge, a little bit more than a pound per barrel of uh, Howertown Mitafru. So we, we have a contract for Howertown Mitafru. We get to select for it. It's, you know, it's really a, a beer that lives by selection and ingredient choices. So we log it for six to eight weeks big horizontal lagering tanks uh we have done it before in conicals but i i'm a firm believer that there is a certain magic that happens when you transfer from a cylindro conical primary on a logger into a horizontal lagering tank there is a surface area thing some autolysis some oxygenation that happens there's magic i don't know what it is i'm not a master brewer <laughs> uh, but it really it shines in the beer. Mm -hmm. I I agree. I don't I don't really know quantifiably what the magic of horizontal tanks is, but it's a thing. I know um, um, Nate had an interview with uh, with uh, Dave Saner from from Alora Brewing, Logger Dave, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was sort of uh, one of the questions Nate had for me before that because you know he's that that's very much an interest of mine is you know trying to visit breweries that that use some of this silly equipment and understand what the hell are, what they're doing because it's just interesting to me um so you know nate sort of was asking me is like you've been to a few of these breweries what's the point why are they doing this and i'm like i don't i don't have an answer for you i just find that there's a correlation between people that are serious about lager and using this equipment but i don't know if it's uh correlation or causation <laughs> Does it does it do anything? I don't know, but it works. <laughs> it it signals something. Yeah, right? it signals it might be that something you care. About dedication to the craft. Mm -hmm. Like most breweries are not built with lagering tanks. Most breweries are not built to brew lager beer. But if you set out to be like, I want to spend more money on a tank, I want it to be less useful. That shows that you're actually going to care about making a, a proper lager beer the right mm -hmm. way. And that, that was sort of my argument is like having that tank forces you to actually keep it in there for the correct amount of maturation time where if it's just another conical tank, you, you, you're you going to be very tempted to move it faster. Very yeah. tempted, right? So maybe that's it, just having the separate thing. But I mean, there are practical reasons like it can help the yeast to flocculate out faster and get clearer beer with it filtration and help to like flash off sulfur better. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's ever been any science on that. I'm sure there's been <laughs> books written about it by old German men, but yeah. I don't agree. Them. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so you talked, uh, you mentioned briefly making a, um, well, what you said is the Aperol seltzer. Um, mm -hmm. You guys have been making hard seltzers for a little while. 
Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you dislike making them or not. I know. I know. I know. When I the last time I visited, you were pretty jazzed about these. Um, can you just tell me about some of the challenges you face when you're making these? Because um, I'm starting to see them pop up a lot more um, here in Canada as well. Um, we're always a little bit slow on the uptake, but it's you know, <laughs> starting to sync up more. Yeah, I saw you guys got White Claw like a month ago. We, we got White Claw like just before <laughs> COVID. Yeah, but it's but but it's in, it's in 500 mil cans. It's in big cans. Oh, we have not those the, too. Not the slim ones. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, we have big cans. I think uh, if you go to like concert venues, you can get a 25 ounce can. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, so, so seltzers are interesting to me. Uh, they're everybody. Everybody just says like, "Oh, you just throw champagne yeast and sugar into a tank. It turns into seltzer. It's delicious. You're done." That's a goddamn lie. Um, we found all kinds of issues with yeast selection. You know, champagne yeast did not work very well for us. We ended up finding a rum yeast. Then we were playing around with different nutrients. You find that some nutrients taste like baked powdered cheese. Some nutrients, when you use enough of them, taste sulfury. You end up with all these problems because of your nutrient selection. And then you run into pH issues because it's not beer. There's no buffering. There's no salts. There's nothing going on there. It's just like sugar and water. As soon as the yeast starts to ferment, like, boom, you're at 3.0 pH and the yeast will die right off. Yep. So we ended up finding using a lot of chalk uh, off of the pH, get the pH as high as you can, honestly. Like we were shooting for like 6.5 or so at a knockout. And within 24 hours, it was like 3.6. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we kept it above 3.5, we'd get good fermentation. we get clean fermentation. We would have to dose multiple times throughout fermentation with some diammonium phosphate. You know, the inorganic nitrogen is not as readily available as organic nitrogen, but the inorganic nitrogen doesn't taste like powdered cheese. Um, we also were not carbon filtering our seltzers. If, if I were a smart man and I was willing to spend money on making seltzers the right way, I'd probably get a carbon filter. Because uh, then you can use organic nitrogen sources, you just filter it afterwards, strip that flavor out, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. but we were trying to make seltzers using like all natural ingredients. So one of our seltzers, we used hibiscus to flavor it, and we were using like whole hibiscus flowers. Uh, another one, we're using whole lemongrass, uh, using whole zest, things of that nature. So by not filtering, we'd end up with a lot of fermentation flaws. We had to like really work around to make a taste for One of the other things that we found worked really well for helping kind of cover some of those flavors, we were brewing our seltzer at like 12% alcohol. And then once it was done fermenting, crash it, and then backwater it back to the 5% alcohol that we were selling. So high fermentation, like high gravity fermentations, uh, centrifuging it, pH control. We tried running through lenticular filters and it didn't really make much of a difference. Um, and then the other, the interesting thing we found was when packaging it, oxygen didn't really matter. Um, no. We, you know, because what makes beer taste bad with oxygen is the oxidizing of the malt components that are left over. Oxidizing cells here, there's nothing to oxidize and like we could have cans that were 800 ppb and cans that were 25 ppb and at 90 days tasting panel they were identical yeah <laughs> it, it made packaging team a lot happier because they didn't have to worry about o2 they could just like rip it fast as possible there's almost no foam um, it's pretty pretty interesting stuff to make uh, we also played around with making really high gravity seltzer so we've got a couple projects using that we ferment that out to anywhere from like 17 to 20 percent alcohol. Um, but, you know, this rum distilling yeast that we were using was it could live well past 25 percent. So um, we made up a bunch of that. We 
played around with like making uh, kind of Negroni inspired cocktails with it, Aperol spritz cocktail. Uh, we made this table beer that we used a little bit of the seltzer for it. And we have another project coming up soon that's very, um, I don't want to use the, the, the T word, but very beach cocktail inspired using some of this high gravity seltzer. So um, it's, it's fun stuff, but you also, like you can't think of it like beer. You know, it's, it's a very different, like, turn part of the brain off. I'm not making proper Bohemian pills here. I'm making this weird <laughs> seltzer thing that's fun and weird and interesting. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, first talking about this with you and, and all these adaptations you had made. And again, like, this was really before people were really talking about it very much in Canada and, you know, talking to you about all these changes you've made. And that was sort of the realization for me is like, holy shit, this is, this is, this is mead. <laughs> all, all these people, all, all the people that want to make hard seltzer need to read a mead book and it's got all, every, all of the information they need. And there's nothing secret about this. Um, yeah. And that's kind of been like, I, I have a little guide that I send out to clients now for, for hard seltzers, but really it is adapted from all of the techniques that are used to maintain nutrient and pH and flavor balance in mead. Uh, it's a very, very similar kind of fermentation at the end of the day. I mean, it's a very similar sugar source. Yeah, you know, Honey is yeah. just very simple sugars. Yeah, you know, We're just using dextrose and a little bit of rice syrup salad so we can mm -hmm. pass the law. Yeah, honey has flavor. I guess that's the main difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's interesting. So we're just, we're just drawing all these parallels, right? Pastry stout for port. <laughs> honey is... Uh, <laughs> Seltzer is mead. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all the same. Pilsners are it's, magic. <laughs> it's it's just it's just fermentation with uh, Saccharomyces. It's it's easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's easy until it's not. No. <laughs> um. So you talked about a bit a bit about I mean a lot of sort of technical brewing things and packaging things. Um, I know you've got a lot of experience with this kind of stuff. I'm just curious to know, like, what are you, what are you, what are you thinking about when you're, you know, brewing or packaging that you don't think that people always consider? Like, what, what really, what really matters to you that isn't always talked about? Uh, you know, I really think that like the final presentation to the customer matters a lot, and it's it's less about like you you want to make sure people get like a clean can. You want to make sure people don't get a can with a wrinkled label or a dent in it or things like this that are like really small and minor in the grand scheme of things, but following the process and having quality throughout it, you know, when somebody picks up a sleek can with a pretty label, it's got like a nice feel to it in the hand that speaks quality to them versus like a, a long neck bottle. That's got a chintzy looking label that looks like it was designed in MS office paint or something. Um, you want to make sure people are, are struck when they walk in the liquor store and see it and go like, I want to buy that. Uh, and then you need to back that up with having a product inside it that was worth their money. Uh, we don't want to have people buy something that has a flashy label. They take it home and are like, it's on my jam. You want to make sure that it's always the highest quality product and it looks right and it, uh, it feels good in the hand and is good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that you would say that. That yeah, I mean, I, I agree one hundred percent that that uh, people drink with their eyes, and and the way that something is presented has a has a really big impact on on um, how it's ultimately perceived, right? Um, the product, the space that the product is presented, and all this stuff does matter, right? And you know, we can. At the end of the day, a lot of people are making a lot of you know similar beer, and the way that that things can be differentiated is either through those little tweaks like having contracts on on the the Hallertown middle through or or on you know having the right presentation in the right space or you know ideally both mm -hmm. um yeah the only thing i would just sort of challenge you on is that you know if it's coming from belgium i kind of want to see the crappy ms paint label that's stuck on sideways that's 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 the only place where that's an indicator of quality <laughs> <laughs> like a, a bottle at Decam that says it's from 2007, but it was actually bottled in 2014. <laughs> yeah, it is, they, they 
they had the labels and they had to get rid of them. Yeah, this, this all seems very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's a certain, I mean, that's, that's you know, a different type of product. It's a different market. <laughs> you know, if you're talking about a four pack of 16 ounce cans that's sold all over the state, shooting for the like kind of casual beer drinker crowd, you got to hit all the marks. Mm-hmm. If you're selling a $25 bottle of Lambic to like some geeks, you know, you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, how would you how would you compare the brewing scenes in in Minnesota and Ontario? Uh, that's a hard question because I don't think it'd be very favorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, I feel like Minnesota is quite black. We have some really smart brewers. We have a brewing industry here. We, we have, you know, down in New Ulm, we have August Shells Brew, which is uh, the second oldest family owned brewery in the country. Mm-hmm. I would argue they're also probably the best brewery in the seat, definitely, and probably in the Eastern U.S. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I, I absolutely the they make, they make some cool stuff. You know, and lockers, like they're they're world class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of cool stuff in Minnesota. You know, that was really my perception is that um, lager is something that's taken really seriously and is widely available. And I know um, we're getting there, and that's really exciting. But it has been kind of more of a niche thing on the on the craft side, like. It's not long ago where the only loggers you would ever see in beer bars was, um, you know, Side Lodge Mountain Lager, which no longer exists, and uh, maybe Tooth and Nail Vim and Vigor, which is that's a great beer. But you know, the the, the focus wasn't really there. Um, I think uh, a lot of people got really good at making hazy IPAs and uh, selling hazy IPAs, and you know that's great. But uh, it's always like it, it, it blows my mind that I can go to a you know a place not very far away and the beer scene is I mean pretty different. Um, I think that that's really cool and you know maybe when it's safe to do so again I I, I would encourage people to travel um, as much as possible because you see these things you see these sort of weird uh, differences between uh, beer scenes and beer markets and uh, it's really cool to have that context. What so what happened to Side Launch Mountain Logger? Did they did Side Launch go out of business or something? Uh, they're they're still active. I think they sort of rejigged a lot of their um, brands and kind of did a bit of a one eighty. So like they're making some sours and IPAs and stuff like that. Um, where you know the focus was a little bit obviously a lot more more German before. Um, so, I mean, maybe that's mm-hmm. responses to market pressure. Um, not really quite sure, um, in that case. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of why. It's been two years since I've been to Ontario. Oh, so like, I, things change fast in the craft beer world. So, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I will say, I mean, in that time, a lot of, a lot of new breweries have opened up. Um, we're sort of seeing like a newer generation of, you know, a lot of the people that were, you know, working in some of these foundational breweries now sort of finding, um, the space and capital to do their own thing and opening up their own places. And there's like a lot of really, you know, cool things, uh, exciting projects happening, um, you know, on that end. Um, so, you know, things are still, are still, uh, interesting, I would say, and you should come visit whenever it's safe to do so. Yeah, I, I would definitely like to come back and drink some of those, uh, the Bumo blends at Burdock. Yep. And yeah, I mean, Burdock's been doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I think uh, they've done a really good job of responding to the current situation. And, you know, they, they started a canning sourdough starter and giving it away for free with orders, <laughs> which is exactly the right thing to be doing in March 2020, as it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that just became a whole, you know, thing of these these blank cans with a, 
you know, a duct tape label that says mom on it, um, giving out the sourdough starter. <laughs> and, uh, That's kind of yeah, amazing. They, they, I'm like, I'm that idea. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They've been moving pretty hard on like low, very low ABV beers. I've seen like a few sub 3% beers come out from them. So, I mean, I've sort of been joking with them that like within a few weeks, they're just going to be canning water. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it just speaks to the, yeah, the adjustments that some businesses have had to make to, to respond to the situation and, you know, stay afloat. Um, it's tough, especially if you, you know, if you're not in, in those like densely populated areas, um, it definitely becomes tricky. Um, yeah, what do you I've think? got a, a good buddy of mine. He owns a small brewery in northern Minnesota called Bemidji Brewing, and uh, like it's kind of like, hard for him. I know he's shifted to almost 100 percent package, and he's still like not making a lot of beer. It's kind of hard. Yeah, it's tough, and, and I'm really uh, concerned that simply because of location or simply because of business model there there's you know some people that are um that are going to be in trouble and uh that that sucks because this is you know this is a very community oriented business and industry and you know it it sucks to see your friends struggling yeah i think you know, like right now kind of the the rallying cry behind beer geeks is like the bad breweries will go out of business. It won't be the good ones. And it's, it's going to take a couple of new ones to fail for people to realize like, Oh no, this is, this is hitting all of us. Yeah. I don't, I, 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 I we're, we're pretty lucky. We're, we're pretty uh, uh, flexible. So we've been able to survive every pain that are high quality breweries. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure that that's, that's the way that the line is going to be drawn. Right. You know, I, I think about, you know, a brewery like Jester King and I think, I think Jeff from Jester King has been pretty transparent about, you know, the trouble they're in being really a destination brewery that, you know, people have to drive out there and have to be on site. And, you know, a lot of the, the sales were on site, um, how how do you make that work in a you know in a world where you can't do that anymore? Um, yeah. People you know all, already aren't buying as much you know expensive sour beer, and then now if you can't sell it on site, uh, you've got a problem, and that really sucks because you know that's a very very well known high quality brewery. Yeah, it's uh, it's scary. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. I mean scary is the only way to call it like mm -hmm. there's going to be some really good breweries that are in a lot of pain after this mm -hmm. how do you how do you see the next year playing out for for craft breweries i think the ones that figure out how to make a dollar right now and keep their staff employed are going to be in a good spot the ones that have laid off all of their production and uh they're just hoping that their staff don't find other jobs are going to be in a lot of hurt because when things start moving again and they have to rehire staff instead of just bringing people back on, that's going to be hard. Uh, mm -hmm. I was also looking at having like 35% staff turnover on top of this. I, I don't know what I would do as a, as a people manager. That just sounds like my nightmare. There's so much cost associated with, with training people and you know and and so much so much value associated with someone spending a lot of time in a business um yeah that that would be a huge problem yeah training and onboarding you know if i bring on a new brewer i assume that for a month he's pretty much going to be like a laborer more or less before they learn what's going on and they learn where everything's at and how to use it and what we in like the fair safe way um that's expensive. Yeah. How are things going at home? It looks like you guys got a lot of uh, sourdough baking going on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, lots of sourdough baking, lots of grilling. You know, it's uh, like 
we, we have a little baby girl, as you know, she's a little uh, three-year-old and she's not at daycare. She's at home with her mom all day. Her mom is working from home while keeping oh, a baby boy. alive. Uh, so lots of bread baking and lots of trying to find things to keep the kid happy and occupied. <laughs> I think wow. our dog hates us right now because we're always home and she doesn't get to sleep anymore. <laughs> yeah, like the, no one thinks about that. Their 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 cycles are totally disrupted. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe dogs need their alone time. <laughs> I need my alone time. I don't know about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, what's uh? How do you see things changing for Fair State uh, moving forward? Like, do you think that this, the, you know, this sort of situation with uh, the you know, curbside pickup and uh, that kind of thing is sustainable, or, or do you guys see a need to sort of change things radically in some way? I think it's got to be sustainable. Is kind of the issue, mm -hmm. you know. So Minnesota is opening back up limited, like on-site drinking. Oh, okay. uh, on the first. Okay. So that on-site drinking is outside only, reservation only. Um, they have to wear masks and limited occupancy. How do you wear so, a mask if you're drinking? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I think you just have to like pull it aside <laughs> and take a sip. I, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, so. For us, you know, we have a patio. We could do this, but our patio would hold like 15 people at limited capacity. So mm -hmm. how are we going to make money having a tap room staff sit there and pour beer for 15 people? Uh, I, I just, I don't see it working. You know, we're, I will probably say doing curbside crawlers until we can open up and people feel comfortable going back to a drinking establishment. Uh, luckily, we also have distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, if color sales start to drop off, then you just you know you you plan your schedule. You make sure you have some real heaters thrown in there. You know, like a hazy IPA with like lactose and vanilla. Bring all the people out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it's definitely we have looked at our beer schedule of like, okay, what's a cool beer that we want to drink versus a cool beer that's going to drive sales. And we've definitely we've made choices based on that because we need to ensure that we have beer that people want to buy. Absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's funny beers that sell really well on site are not the beers that sell really well to go. Mm -hmm. You know, our Hefeweizen is a fantastic Hefeweizen. Uh, I would argue it's probably one of the better ones in the state. And in a can, it doesn't really sell very well, but on draft, people buy the crap out of it. Huh. So we're not going to make 90 barrels a half, but we're definitely going to make 90 barrels of like a new hazy IPA. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to ask you. Like, what is what is selling right now? I know I, I've seen a lot of chatter about people shifting toward low ABV session beers, lagers. I don't see that in the numbers right now. It's not there in the numbers. It's in the in people's minds. People want to say. <laughs> drink a lot of low ABV beer and they want to say that they drink Saison's and they want to say that they drink sour beer. The reality is people drink IPAs. Yeah. They drink hazy IPAs. They drink West coast IPAs. They drink low ABV IPAs. They drink double IPAs. They drink fruited and smoothie and vanilla and uh, every, every other type of IPA. So if we, if we throw in 22 pounds of cry cryo mosaic or something, it's gonna sell. Mm -hmm. If you make a lager beer, it might not sell. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so like just for the perspective of, of Fair State, you're still ha making and selling a lot of a lot of hoppy beers. That that seems to be still oh, very much so. The driver was that the case yeah. before as well? Oh yeah, you know probably sixty five percent of our production was IPA. Mm -hmm. Uh, different types. We have a couple core brand IPAs, and then throughout the year, our LTO calendar was probably about 50% IPAs of some sort. Okay. Uh, we also make sure that our LTO calendar has a lot of 
hop or a lot of lagers, uh, some interesting fruited beers, and then some pastry stouts. You know, actually today our guys were canning up uh, uh, this beer. I'm drinking a loaf right now. Um, it's a collab with Modern Times, and it's a cool. four and a half percent alcohol corn lager. Uh, awesome. It's going to go into twelve packs. People are going to go great crazy for it. But uh, I think if we released a corn lager every month, it probably wouldn't sell as well. <laughs> that's yeah, that's a good point too. Uh, I guess I guess the novelty factor really plays in as well. And like having those things sort of planned ahead so that, you know, there's always something new every week or couple weeks or month for, for people to be interested in, like matters more than ever. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're trying to get creative with that too. It's like, how do we, <laughs> how do we keep all these brewers who are now, you know, busy as hell engaged in uh, <laughs> what we're doing and, you know, having to come up with more and more ridiculous ways to <laughs> solve that problem. <laughs> Have you, have you seen people buying different yeast because of the crisis or are like orders kind of the same breakdown as before? What we're seeing is, is um, a little bit of consolidation in, in, in the types of, of products that people are ordering. So yeah, simply just based on, on the yeast sales, I would say that, that a lot of people have, or a lot of breweries have, you know, recognized that it's, it's the the hazy IPAs and kettle sours and uh, loggers that are that are what are making them money, and so we're seeing a lot more emphasis on those kinds of things versus maybe some of the yeast that might be used for one-offs or less popular styles. So things like saisons or like the specialty mm -hmm. Belgian strains, we're seeing less of that, more of the um, lacto and and uh, hazy IPA strains, and um, still you know the lager strains are still popular so um that's kind of what we're seeing the, the other big thing i think the shift that we've seen with the breweries is that uh, a lot of them are are pilot batching like a lot of them are buying homebrew pitches to do pilot batches you know either at the brewery or at home and test out ideas because maybe 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 this isn't the case anymore because now you know people are getting busy because it's summer again but you know, certainly in, in March and April, there's a lot of people doing some pilot batching and um, trying out some of some of the newer, more interesting yeasts out there. So that does you know that does get me excited for you know some people uh, maybe that otherwise would not have had the time to experiment with something brand new. And you know we did release a couple things during this time, um, really get the time to to test that out and you know then have the confidence to say yeah I want to pick up you know, a, a full size pitch of this thing. So yeah, I don't know. Try to try to make lemonade wherever we can, I guess. <laughs> but this is kind of cool. See, make like, in yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do what you can. Uh, seeing a lot of the, the, the pro brewers, you know, getting more interested in home brewing. Uh, and then just seeing a lot of people getting more interested in home brewing. And that, that really has been the most seismic shift is is how much more interest there is on the homebrew side and i think a lot of people that like homebrewing but just don't have the time day to day um kind of rekindled that in the last couple months and you know hopefully it's not a blip hopefully it it per can persist a little bit but but that's been really cool to see um how a lot of people did you know take some of this time that they had and um get back into homebrewing or you know dial in their homebrewing even further um and that's cool to see you know maybe I mean, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm sure the homebrew stores are just like the like bread baking aisle at the grocery store it's like everything's gone decimated <laughs> well yeah i mean the the grocery stores were out of yeast for for a long time um mm -hmm. some of them still are which is kind of crazy because it's like yeah Go to a homebrew shop. They're going to have yeast. It's going to be more expensive, but they have it. <laughs> our, uh, our local grocery store that's just down the road has been out of yeast since it started. I was there this weekend, and I looked and still no yeast. They were completely out of sugar. They were out of, uh, like, all types of flour except whole wheat. Like, just decimated. <laughs> That's, Everybody's that's learning crazy. how to make sourdough 
this uh, the last two months. It's really fun. <laughs> Absolutely, that that's uh, obviously been a you know a pretty massive trend as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, the the yeast shortage thing is just so mind blowing to me because it's like I I know how this stuff is made. It's <laughs> I guess for some of those plants, and especially you know maybe they had seen redu reduction in demand over time. So maybe maybe the Fleischmann's plants weren't you know really operating at full steam and had to make some adjustments to get going or something. <laughs> but that's that's just like kind of crazy to me. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably like a, a hiccup of packaging. You know, packaging is always going to be a big issue, and then also just like the supply chain, moving trucks mm -hmm. and sending shipments takes time. All yeah. these things take time to shake out. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's funny. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe they need Kvike so that it grows a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> Does Kvike work for bread? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've done some experiments. Not not always nice. not always faster in dough than, than industrial, like, bread yeast, but uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, the Voss, nice. the, yeah, the Voss grain works pretty pretty well for for breads. They uh, um, for like cold proof breads, like pizza dough, it, it works really well because they're pretty good at cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. We've that's, been doing that's, that's everything just now. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. We actually did sourdough pizza the other day. That turned out really well. Nice, nice. I think at some point, I don't know if this is an escarpment thing or some other thing, but I think I think uh, there needs to be like some kind of like bread thing from from escarpment's end as well, because um, I know we've got a few a few bread nerds among our ranks. <laughs> Pass along our knowledge. I mean, you guys should start selling like a sixteen ounce can full of sourdough, just like burdock, mm -hmm. and then do like a webinar on how to make bread from said can. It'd be genius. That that was definitely a plan like that got very close to execution. Um, there were some food safety challenges associated with that. Um, the reason being, that. well, sourdough can be both an ingredient and a processing aid. So because it qualify, it could qualify. If someone were to buy this and then use it in a commercial product, it would have to be a listed ingredient. There were greater food safety limitations than just like a yeast culture has essentially. So. That was the challenge there. That being said, I think uh, we can still find a way to do it. Um, <laughs> definitely been been uh, talking to some people about some ways to to try to get a um, some kind of sourdough starter um, out there and available in a little bit more um, capacity than than you know and a little more shelf life than than some of the other options that are out there. Although you know I wholeheartedly support the the beer cans full of starter. That's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're at a, a little over an hour now. Um, is there anything that, that we haven't talked about that you, that you, that you would like to cover? Uh, I think we're good. Cool. I think we should probably shotgun a, uh, a lager beer and then be done with it. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I've got to, <laughs> I've got to go get mine. Okay. But, uh, but I can, I can come back here in a couple seconds. It's also, okay. it's going to be lager beer. All right. For those of you that care, I'll be shotgunning a corn lager. feedback there. you meet yourself Richard yeah. <laughs> one of those things yeah if, if I, I took my uh, my headphones out and uh, that changes everything apparently no, um, so yeah, I, I spoke a little bit earlier about about the uh, the current beer shortage in our apartment, and uh, so I dropped by the lab 
um, this evening to, to try to find a, a can of lager, and um, this is all they had left. Ooh, sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is that a 16 ounce or 500 mil? That is a 16 ounce, yeah. 473. I know I'll be faster than you with my 12 ounce can. <laughs> I think so. I think you have a little more experience than I do as well. It's okay. I believe in you. <laughs> okay. All right. What do you what do you have in there? Uh corn lager. Ah, excellent. Okay. Great. All right, let's do this. <laughs> Rock and roll. I'll wait for you. You do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's that, the uh, uh, is first. That is on camera. I think so. Um, we've done a lot of sabering, but not a lot of shotgunning. But you know what? It's 2020. Now is the time. There's no rules anymore. Perfect. <laughs> this is the state of the beer industry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe Wells. <laughs> Thank you, man. It was a, a nice ramble. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, i want to thank everyone for uh sticking with us um through through this uh through this interview a lot of a lot of honestly interesting stuff um and uh just want to remind everyone we got one more webinar coming up on tuesday and then we're going to take a break um you know maybe uh spend our evenings outside uh you know grilling some stuff and drinking some beer and relaxing and then you know, come back when uh, um, everyone's ready to learn again. Um, I don't know when that's going to be. Maybe, maybe, maybe July. Maybe, maybe September. But uh, <laughs> looking forward to the warm weather. I think everyone is. And uh, yeah, get outside while you can because um, the last few months have really stuck. You've <laughs> been Ross. Uh, I did notice uh, before we leave here, we got some questions. Should we answer these real oh, quick? We should. Yeah. This one's uh, popped up recently. Okay, special equipment to better handle pastry stouts, uh, a centrifuge. I would not want to do it without centrifuge. It's the greatest piece of equipment that we own. I've been talking about building an infusion tank with like a wedge wire false bottom in it, so we can put like whole coconut uh, and then filter it out, but haven't gotten around to it yet. We're still able to do it pretty well without. Mm -hmm. uh, pitching rates for big stouts. Two million cells per mil per degree Play-Doh seems to be about right. Uh, pitch for the full 100 barrels for like a 25 barrel knockout in the beginning and then rock and roll. Best yeast corn lager, Augustiner lager yeast. It's delicious and I think Richard sells it now. Uh, uh, yeah. It did go off the rails. Uh, there, You are correct. The webinar did go off the rails and um, Augustiner lager yeast. Um, yeah, uh, usually my, my cryptic answer to that is that my favorite beer garden in Munich is by the train station. <laughs> that is a fine answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think we'll sign yeah. off now. Thank, I really appreciate the, uh, the lightning round uh, Q&A. Um, maybe we'll <laughs> adopt that in the future. Cool. You have All right. Cheers. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, soon. <laughs> Whatever soon means. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>